Welcome everyone. This is the Diabetes UK and British Summit Medical Association managing patients with diabetes during Ramadan. We will be recording this meeting. We've started recording now, so please do turn off your camera and go on to mute. Uh, the recording of the will be available on our YouTube channel after the second running of this webinar next week. Um, there will be time for questions at the end via a Slido poll. Um, so my name is Aoife Sattery. I'm tackling inequality engagement lead here at Diabetes UK. We've um, to put this session on this evening after working in partnership with British Islamic Medical Association, who've been helping us to update our Ramadan materials, and we'll share a link for those at the end of the webinar as well. We've got a Slido poll um, at the beginning now just to see how confident you feel at the moment about um, talking to your patients about Ramadan. So if you are able to join that, you can use the QR code. Uh, or if you go onto slido.com and pop the um, code number in there, you'll be able to join. And there's a little poll to fill in about how confident you feel about talking about Ramadan at the moment. And this will also be where you're able to um, add questions for our presenters later on. If you're having any trouble um, with uh, using the Slido, if you just pop a message in the chat, we've got quite a few Diabetes UK staff on the call who'll be able to help you with that as well. So um, this evening we're going to start with hearing from um, Bilal Axi, who is somebody who lives with type 1 diabetes, who spoke to us earlier in the week um, about the importance of support for fasting during Ramadan for people who live with diabetes. Hi, first of all, my name is uh, Bilal Axi. I'm type 1 diabetic. I've almost been diabetic for nine years. Um, I'm a, by profession, I'm a gas engineer. So I'm always active within my work and um, deal with that type of diabetes at all times. When the first Ramadan came round, um, for me, in my culture, in my kind of background, in my upbringing, Ramadan is like second nature for me. I don't think twice about it. So when I was diagnosed with uh, type 1 diabetic, I actually just start fasting without realising or without asking any support help because I didn't think anything of it because when I got diagnosed Ramadan kind of started quite fairly soon after that as I was fasting through um, it was actually helped my diabetes because my basal and bolus had to kind of reduce my insulin down especially my basal background insulin had to reduce that down to stabilize it and when I told my professional body that I was fasting they were kind of surprised they were like what do you mean you're fasting? I'm like, yeah, I'm just kind of fasting. And they're like, it, it is one of those kind of things they didn't realise type ones could fast or they didn't, they didn't have the kind of right solutions or the answers for it. And I didn't think anything of it as well. Be, being naive, being new to type one diabetic, I didn't think anything of it. I, I did have a few hypos. Obviously, I, I treated them at the time. The good thing is, uh, especially with my religion, I'm actually exempt for um, fasting. But because of the love how and the passion behind it and the benefits from fasting that's why I kind of continued on fasting with, with that as well now there's a lot more resources from when I've started so there's a lot more knowledge a lot more um, uh, information out there for uh, type 1 diabetes and I think a lot more people are aware of it which is quite refreshing quite nice because Ramadan is like, it's effective as like a restart button for myself it just affects my body, my mind, my soul, everything that comes with it. What the challenges that are faced, what the common anxieties people might face, I think that a lot of people that don't talk about it, the anxiety that they can face from day to day basis with Ramadan, especially leading up to it, is the fact that they want to talk to a professional body or someone that has an understanding and being comfortable with them to be openly talking about it rather than kind of being a taboo subject about it. Mm. You myself, I know people that maybe still do fast but don't tell the, the, their professional body or the doctors. And reason being, it's just an uncomfortable thing that they may, may not understand or they don't know the concept behind it or they don't know the reasoning behind it. But this is where professional clinics should take a step up and learn and understand this because it's, there's different faiths, there's different backgrounds, but this is specifically for Ramadan. And you want the person, whoever is coming to you, any patient that's coming to you, to be comfortable in that room, to openly talk about it being judged. See, especially nowadays, um, you need to be really open-minded with everything that's going on. Yeah. I want the patient to feel comfortable 
with any practitioner, with any professional body to openly talk about it. Just read up on that, just get a basic understanding. And if the doctors are unsure, like us as Muslims, though, we like when people ask us questions, it's just out of curiosity awareness. So the religious perspective, by all means, ask. But when it comes to the kind of professional perspective, that's where the doctors need to step up and think, right, where can I like give exception to this? And where I need to give exemption to this? So it's just trying to broaden that kind of mindset towards it. Um, just to summarise what Bilal was saying, he was um, struggling uh, to get the support he needed during Ramadan initially. And when he was first diagnosed, he actually fasted without speaking to his healthcare professional at all, because uh, it didn't occur to him that, that they would be able to support him. And he talked about the importance of every healthcare professional being proactive and, and talking about Ramadan and, and not assuming that people wouldn't want to fast. Um, our next speaker is um, Dr. Nazim Guri, who is a consultant physician at the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital in Glasgow and an honorary clinical associate professor at the University of Glasgow. Um, Nazim um, is also um, a, a researcher who has looked in extensively into sacred Islamic knowledge with a contemporary focus and his research and teaching interests relate to his clinical and academic expertise as well as ethnicity and faith with a particular interest in fasting during Ramadan and he is joint senior editor of the British Islamic Medical Association Ramadan Compendium so I'm going to hand over now to Nazim. Thank you uh, Aoife for that uh, and yes uh, Welcome to everybody to this first joint uh, session that we have between British Islamic Medical Association and Diabetes UK. It's an honour for me to be representing both uh, bodies uh, and also to Bilal, who is my patient, who actually got diagnosed with diabetes just before Ramadan started. Uh, and the, Bilal is an excellent individual who has understood his diabetes, understood his faith aspect and has tried to marry the two. He's very much in a unique situation as well that he's got a team, a consultant who are very much focused towards helping him do what he wants to do in terms of facilitating safe fasting. And I appreciate that not everybody, not every uh, trust can offer such uh, a service or resource. Nonetheless, it's something to be aspirational towards and to highlight that when you can, when you do offer such a service, how it is valued by patients. So uh, thank you for as well for introduction, which kind of summarizes some of my kind of experience areas uh, of expertise and uh, kind of passion for uh, this topic and the broader kind of aspect of faith uh, and health. <clears throat> In terms of today's agenda, um, the, um, it's a fairly basic uh, kind of agenda. In terms, I'm going to summarise uh, some guidance that we have on Ramadan uh, and diabetes and being able to fast during the month. <clears throat> Excuse me. One thing I would say is that the evidence base in, in general is not that good in terms of like the robustness of studies, the quality of the studies and even the specificity of the studies. So it is very much uh, healthcare professional led in terms of when uh, it comes to making decisions and the evidence there is to help guide uh, those that are helping patients to fasting. And I'm using the Greater Glasgow and Clyde guidelines as a base, but this is the guidelines that I've authored for uh, the region that I work in, which is the largest uh, trust in the UK, if I remember correctly, by size. Uh, uh, in the, uh, our, our patient population and also it is often referred to by the rest of uh, NHS Scotland as well. Uh, the Diabetes and Ramadan International Alliance guidelines with the International Diabetic Federation, Diabetes Federation have a, a, an international guidance that have come out, has come out in 2021 and I will be referring to that uh, as well. Uh, but I'm very much making focus towards you as healthcare uh, practitioners and in terms of what you should be thinking about and knowing about when it comes to Ramadan and your patient uh, and also uh, to get give enough skills or uh, at least get the ball rolling in terms of your thought process when it comes to how to approach your patient. Someone has muted me, sorry. <laughs> uh, it's difficult to, to have this presentation without me speaking, but I'll try to be as pleasant as I can. So in terms of our responsibilities as healthcare practitioners, uh, this is from 2010 from Professor Sir Aziz Sheikh, who's now Professor and Head of Primary Care Research at the uh, University of Oxford, and Ghazal Amir from Leeds. And these two points really highlight the initial divergence that, has, uh, that was picked up on between uh, Muslim patients and their healthcare practitioners. Uh, a lot of it, the feeling uh, come uh, of the of the patient is that the healthcare practitioner in front of me does not understand me or my religion or what's important to me. 
uh, and that there's like, this perception that they don't want to engage in what's important to me as a Muslim. So I just want to keep this in mind when we're doing this presentation and why we're very much doing what we're doing. The hope is that since uh, this was published in 2010, there has been a positive movement in terms of uh, healthcare practitioner and patient dialogue when it comes to matters such as fasting, for example. In terms of definitions of Ramadan, uh, as I was just looking at this before we started, uh, the word Ramadan uh, is an Arabic word, or Ramadan is the, how you would say it uh, from the kind of Arabic perspective. And the literal meaning of the word is to is to to bake or an intense heat. And some people say it's used as a kind of way of purifying. In terms of the, the Islamic legal definition, it's uh, one of the five religious pillars. So it's a religious obligation. And in short, what that means for the individual is that there's no food, uh, drink or anything that enters the GI tract and no marital relations between dawn and dusk uh, for one month. Uh, and that's a lunar month, so it's so 29 or 30 days. Uh, and it occurs every 354 days or so according to the Gregorian calendar based on the fact that we have 12 uh, months in the Islamic calendar. Uh, and basically the starting of the fasting coincides with the starting of the morning prayer and the end of the fast coincides with the end of the fourth and uh, start of the fourth prayer, which is just as, as soon as the sun has set. And it's obligatory for any individual who's attained the age of puberty, uh, is sane and is physically capable of fasting. In terms of a glossary of terms I will be using throughout the presentation, one, the first word is the word suhoor or the pre-dawn meal or food consumed before the fast starts and the iftar, which is a meal or food consumed when opening the fast uh, just after sun at sunset. The word sharia uh, is uh, referred to and that's when we are talking about religious or sacred uh, um, Islamic law. So when I talk about sharia, I'm talking about the Islamic legal perspective. Uh, but forget all those definitions. What does it mean for the individual who is going to be fasting? And what it means is all the stuff I mentioned before, but it's a time of year where an extra effort is made in the religious and spiritual pursuits. A time when a family and community often get together as well, whether it's to consume food, get together or celebrate uh, the month or to pray. And you can see that pic the second picture there's uh, children lined up praying. And this is very much key. It's a very much uh, involved uh, uh, men, women, children, adults of all ages, and every, it's about doing what you can in the month. And the important thing I want to focus on is doing what you can. And as Bilal mentioned, it's a time of year that a lot of Muslims look forward to because it's an opportunity to really focus on that spiritual side, uh, which often gets neglected in the remaining 11 months of the year. The fasts themselves are quite long. Uh, and uh, uh, when it comes to the summertime in temperate regions. What that means is those regions that are further away from the equator, if Ramadan falls in the summer, so for example, that usually means in the months of May to August, and those are in the northern hemisphere, and likewise kind of um, November to kind of February time in, in, in the southern hemisphere, the days can be pretty long. And in 2019, when the days were at their peak, we were looking at an excess of 18 hours, depending on the calculation used to determine the dawn uh, time in particular, because it's, it's somewhat arbitrary because you don't have a true dawn uh, in temperate regions um, and as the day starts shortening uh, as we're experiencing now because Ramadan basically gets 11 days earlier or so every year we're now looking at a start date around about the 10th of March or so uh, and for example in London that means uh, 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 we're looking at a fast that's probably going to be around 13 and a half hours at the start of the month. And as they get towards the end of the month, uh, at, the, at the beginning of April, we're going to get into closer to 15 hours, which you can see is not quite the excess of the 18 hours from just simply uh, four or five years ago. Um, and just to kind of highlight that change, that transition, even if you were to look at Birmingham or uh, Manchester or Bradford or Glasgow or Edinburgh, by and large, when you look at the timetable, you're looking at fasting uh, of around 15 hours or more, potentially uh, uh, up to uh, 16 hours or more when it comes to the longest fast. And just to give context, if you were to think about it, if somebody were to have an evening meal around, say, six, seven o'clock at night and then not have anything to eat until breakfast the morning after, potentially that is almost looking at a 14 hour fast. So it sounds a lot, but the reality is many individuals probably fast in excess of 12 hours are realizing on a daily basis. 
Uh, is it a big issue, Ramadan? Are we talking? I mean, is it much ado about nothing? Why are we doing this presentation? Well, around five percent in England uh, are Muslim by census data. Uh, Thirteen. all the way up to maybe even one in uh, nine, um, for example. Uh, the majority are of a South Asian, that's uh, uh, by, by and large Pakistan and Bangladeshi background, uh, and Arab, and they're accounting for around 3.2% of the UK population. But there are obviously Muslims from other backgrounds as well, including uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, East Asia, uh, North Africa. Uh, uh, so, so it's not purely exclusive to the South Asian uh, contingent, but they are by and large the largest contributors to the Muslim population in the UK. Uh, we know that South Asians and Arabs are associated with an increased prevalence of type 2 diabetes, so they're already a high risk group when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Uh, and we also know that from, from, from data that South Asians are associated with poorer control uh, compared to uh, the indigenous white population. There's no real evidence that that gap has narrowed significantly. And globally, around 90% of Muslims pass if you were to look at some of the global data that's out there. Uh, are there anything specific, is there anything specific to worry about? Uh, well, the answer is yes and no. I mean, no if patients are fasting safely and those who are supposed who are who are um, supported with fasting and, and are told it's OK to fast probably experience less of an issue. However, not everybody has access to medical advice or indeed will want to follow it. Uh, but some basic uh, risks exist regardless of whether a person has higher risk or not. And that includes hypoglycemia, particularly in the temperate regions when there are longer fasts than I touched on the duration earlier. Um, uh, as I mentioned, sometimes individuals, even though they're advised not to fast, will still fast because they have a strong desire to do so. And sometimes that can be a misunderstanding of what the expectation is on the individual, and we'll touch on this. Um, we have DVLA standards expectations when it comes to glycemic levels and driving. So, for example, hypoglycemia and what to do. Um, uh, and we know that driving during Ramadan is already associated with a slight increased risk of sleep uh, uh, related road traffic uh, accidents. I'm just going to take control back of the slide so that I can uh, make uh, move through things. Um, let me just see. Magnify slide for all. Oops, sorry. Oops, sorry about that. I didn't mean to do that. What have I done here? Let me go back to the slide. I, in my attempt to try and make slides bigger, uh, made a mistake here. One moment. Uh, why do we do this? If I don't know if you want to do take yeah, back. Do you want me to, if I take control from you and you take it back again, that might yep. work. Yep. Yeah, we, we can still see the same slide you were on, Nazim. OK, so you can still see the same slide. OK, that's fine. So I can just go through it one by one then. So the only thing now is I wanted to go back to actually being able to change it from grid view one second. Uh, one moment. No worries. I'm happy to share them for you if that's okay. easier for you to see Can them. Things presenter. Let me take back control. OK, here we go. OK, so here we go. Uh, here we go. OK, is there anything else we need to be thinking about? Well, multimorbidity, polypharmacy, frailty, cognitive impairment, some of all these need to be factored in for each individual patient. What that means is that factors that we consider or factor in when it comes to general patient management do not go away just because somebody wishes to fast. Uh, driving is an example of uh, complex areas uh, uh, because we have to factor in secular legislation with Islamic legislation on a subject and there is a paper that we have written on, uh, published on it to kind of guide individuals but also to highlight how the, inter the interplay exists between secular and religious law which is quite interesting for those that want to get a feel for the Sharia and the principles where it derives from, where it fits in when it comes to need and necessity and health, for example. Uh, that's uh, BMJ Diabetes Research and Care, it's 2018. Uh, and if you put my surname in, you should be able to pull that paper. And ultimately, uh, 
part of what we're trying to do with all of this is that we're trying to make things easy for decision making to be sensitive and relevant to the Muslim patient and that a patient should not feel that there's some kind of contradiction between um, uh, secular and religious particulars. Is it a big issue in terms of uh, numbers? Uh, this is from Diabetes Lance, uh, Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology and in that they say that if you're to look at uh, the uh, then uh, the if you look at fasting, for example, uh, fasting in the general population, I said it was about 5%. Fasting in the diabetes population might be approaching even 25%. So from a diabetes population perspective, uh, Ramadan is not an insignificant uh, matter when it comes to people who uh, fast and have diabetes. In terms of fasting and uh, exemptions, I think it's important to understand the religious concept of sick leave. It does exist, and I'm taking the verse directly from the Muslim holy book, the Quran, um, and uh, the uh, uh, verse 184 in particular of the second chapter, which is the cow. For a certain days, of, a number of days, uh, you, you basically are fasting. But whoever among you is sick or on a journey, then he or she shall fast a like number of other days. And those that are not able to do it may effect redemption by feeding a poor man. God desires e Allah, Allah desires ease for you, and He does not desire for you difficulty, and He does and, and He desires that you complete the number. What this means is that uh, if there is a valid reason or excuse not to fast, be it uh, because of illness or travel, then you don't fast, and what you do is you make up the days when you can make them up, and that can be at another time of year. Conveniently, for those that are living in in a temperate region, that means the winter provides an excellent opportunity to make up fast when the days are much shorter and therefore potentially safer when it comes to to fasting. Uh, and the important thing to understand with this is that it's very explicitly stated that God is not in uh, uh, need of uh, difficulty and the thing with difficulty we should understand is there is an expectation of hardship when it comes to undertaking a religious obligation but it should not get to the extent where it actually compromises uh, physical or mental well-being or safety so hardship is different to um, uh, the concept of undue difficulty and this is very important that Hard, uh, that when they talk about a bit of difficulty and hardship is subjective and it will be patient uh, or person centric, but uh, it should not lead to uh, reach a, a threshold where you're actually thinking about uh, somebody's health or safety being compromised. And in terms of the specific definition of sickness, we do have this uh, within uh, the faith as well. So generally we define uh, sickness as an ailment that worsens through fasting, especially if it causes irreversible damage or causing significant impairment. And this include, it can include old age and frailty, an ailment, the healing of which is delayed by fasting. So, for example, if somebody is taking antibiotics three times a day because they've got a chest infection and they need to go on specific antibiotics, and by not taking antibiotics because they're fasting, it delays healing uh, or the recovery or makes things worse. And that would be uh, uh, an a good example of that. Or a legitimate fear of the above. So we don't have the evidence that it's, it's going to happen because we, don't, we obviously don't want to put ourselves in that predicament, but we know based on first principles or whatever it may be that it is, it's, it's very much going to happen. And again, in terms of the uh, the, uh, the legitimate fear or, for example, uh, whose, whose word would count. So prior experience of fasting and what it does to the ailment, common knowledge that by fasting with that ailment, things will get worse. So, for example, a person with Addison's disease who does not take their steroids, and I'm specifically referring to those who take hydrocortisone, for example, it's multiple daily dosing, uh, that clearly the, their health and well-being will be compromised if they are fasting and only just taking, for example, just one dose and delaying the others. Or the opinion of a qualified Muslim physician on the matter, so it's recognised, and I use the word Muslim in brackets because that's what the, addition, uh, the historic books refer to, but what this actually means is that individuals who um, uh, are uh, who are seeking advice, if there's a qualified physician and and they understand what Ramadan involves, or uh, and they understand what is entailed with fasting, and also entailed by fasting when you have illness or not modifying treatment, and they're concerned that there's going to be uh, uh, deterioration, then they're and they, and they advise not to fast. That would be seen as a legal, uh, a legally valid position from the Sharia. That, would, that an individual could hold to if they do not wish to fast. And just a bit of this uh, dispelling of myths. Uh, now, ordinarily I make this interactive, but because there's so many in the room, I'm just going to give a, a few seconds to pause before sharing the answer. 
can a person taking subcutaneous can a person taking subcutaneous insulin uh, while fasting? So can a person take subcutaneous insulin while fasting, in, i.e. inject insulin while fasting? The answer is yes, they can. And for more information on drugs and routes of administration, there's a paper in the BMJ which touches on routes that uh, invalidate and do not invalidate the fast uh, uh, when it comes to taking medication and fasting. A person can't break their fast if they become unwell. So if you uh, if you're fasting and you become unwell, you're not allowed to break your fast. The answer is no. Of course you can. Pregnant and nursing mothers have to fast. No, uh, they they're not obliged to fast if there's a particular risk to mother and or baby, and that comes back to the three criteria I mentioned earlier in terms of uh, um, causing harm or delaying recovery or the legitimate fear of, of either. There are various guidelines out there, as I mentioned at the start of the talk, on the management of diabetes in Ramadan. Some are national, some are international, and there are trust guidelines that I'm sure each of the trusts will have, and Diabetes UK have resources as well. Uh, as I mentioned, the original body of evidence is growing, but it's still a nascent field. And I also feel looking at the data, when you look at the studies, that not all the uh, uh, specifics of a study may be relevant to the person in front of you. So you might have an excellent study which shows a drug is safe or a regime is safe or not. But again, because because as I mentioned, geography being one aspect and lifestyle, what they do, uh, access to being able to check blood sugars, there's so many variables that come into play that even a paper which looks like very good evidence because it's a randomized control trial, for example, still may not be fully relevant to the person or patient in front of you because of other factors. I think this is very important. Uh, but the common messages often come from all the guidelines and uh, the advice that's out there and, and the studies is, uh, is uh, our common messages are plan for Ramadan in, in advance, which is why we're doing this seminar two months before Ramadan starts. You have enough time to think about your patients, have a consultation with them, have a discussion, allow for some deliberation and also potential modification of treatment in advance of Ramadan so you can take it running. Risk stratify your, your patient. So uh, the new IDF DAR tool, which you'll have seen and now is a score based or a risk score based system. It is grade four evidence the way things stand. It's a useful adjunct to things, but I don't think it necessarily replaces an, a, a healthcare practitioner discussion with a patient and their own clinical judgment. Trial fasting, and this is something that's mentioned in the BMJ pa uh, paper on chronic disease and fasting, in that we encourage individuals, in particularly the, 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 the two or three weeks leading up to Ramadan, to try fasting one or two days consecutively or apart, just to see how the body copes, how to see the if the changes that you've made or with medication or insulin doses is going to fare uh, when it comes to the actual month itself. So it means that if you need further tweaking, it allows for it. Equally, if you realize it's a no-go, you can uh, make that decision not to fast in advance. It might, it might be that, it, that you can only really realize this at the start of Ramadan when you've done two or three consecutive days to see how things are going, and we'll touch on this later. Lifestyle and, and advice and targeted education and explore treatment options. Not always a treatment change is necessary. Do we need to modify or change things? And another common message is it's the patient's choice at the end of the day. Uh, so this is a flow diagram here uh, to uh, show, for example, in, in from the Greater Glasgow Clyde guidelines, how we would approach uh, the, uh, the the planning stage, you know, four to twelve weeks before Ramadan starts, to risk stratify the patient, structured education on various uh, aspects, including that which is listed, uh, for example, fluids and meal planning, advice and exercise, medication adjustments, and then based on that uh, risk stratification, generally we'll advise to fast or not to fast, uh, or um, and again, that's based on risk stratification, very high risk groups, high risk and moderate or low risk groups. And I'm aware that the 2021 DAR guidelines use a slightly different wording for the risk categories, but the, the concept of risk stratification has not gone away and is the theme or essence to good Ramadan planning. Uh, not every patient wants to fast. Uh, they'll have reasons for and against and part of it might just be a fear and they've just never been able to discuss it with somebody or they've had a prior negative experience when they haven't been prepared properly so even if they don't want to fast uh, just ask them why is it they may not 
wish to fast. It might be a legitimate fear that you can alleviate, uh, which was legitimate once upon a time, which you might be able to alleviate through things because it's about giving patients an opportunity to uh, to explore the options available to them and not just purely saying, well, you don't want to fast, that's fine, my job is easy. Sometimes they want to discuss with a Muslim physician, not because a Muslim physician is better than a non-Muslim physician, but it's because that concept of being able to relate and having things in common that make discussion easier and, and dialogue easier. Uh, they might want to speak to an imam or a scholar because, again, they might not necessarily trust uh, the advice that a healthcare practitioner is giving, even though they have a religious basis to it, and that's fine. Uh, but it's important that, uh, and any good imam or scholar will often say, what is the medical advice on it? Because they'll never disregard it because they understand how important it is, and in many ways it trumps the decision or advice they give. For many patients, it's an opportunity to lose weight or stop smoking. Um, uh, and also we have to think about meal timings, etc. And we'll touch on this later. Sometimes secondary care referral or discuss with a community diabetes specialist nurse who can discuss with their link consultant, for example, for more complex patients may be needed, particularly for those in primary care or pharmacists who are taking the lead when it comes to patient management. We work as a team, so reach out to those who can help, whether it's in primary care or secondary care. Sick day rules do not go away and are, should always be emphasised and be followed, particularly when it comes to type 1 diabetes, and they remain. Uh, emphasis at sick and uh, uh, the illness and safety are are valid reasons to either terminate a fast or abstain from fasting. And again, what to do if recurrent persisting circumstances occur uh, when it comes to the following of sick day rules. Uh, so again, uh, the, the the IDF DAR guidance very much moves from a low to I put in brackets very because that's the prior guidance made use of the word very high risk to high risk. And again, the following factors that are listed there uh, all um, contribute to that. And some of them I have added in which are not necessarily included in the DAR guidance. And I think one thing we often overlook, particularly with an aging population with elderly people that live alone is cognition, the degree of frailty in old age. Uh, if a person is not going to be safe in their environment, then that in itself could be a reason to advise not fasting. If, for example, they're living with family, that's a different situation. So even to old people who share everything in common, apart from one living with family and one not living with family, uh, that could make a deal. That could be the difference between fasting and not fasting. Pa type of work, such as shift working, night shifts, the pattern of work, and for example, the, if a lot of physical activity involved. For example, when the pandemic was in full swing, many individuals had to wear PPE, which is causing a lot of dehydration, making things very uncomfortable. And for many individuals, uh, they actually had to break their fast because it was too difficult. So again, these circumstances may be things that we do not think of, excuse me, initially, but can arise through the journey. Uh, in terms of the previous DAR based risk table, which I think was actually quite good, and I prefer the risk table to the the, the scoring system, and I'll touch on this why later. It, um, um, it's quite small there uh, on that, but you can hopefully click on the link uh, to the GGNC guidelines, which has this in, in a bigger font. Um, but again, it highlights those uh, patients that you might think would be safer for fasting and those that would be less safe for fasting. Um, and I think uh, one thing we have to understand are individuals who are who have type 1 diabetes, who have poor control, have DKA or have problems with hypoglycemia or hypoglycemia in awareness, they are very much at the top of their risk. Uh, and at the very bottom of the risk, you have patients, for example, who are just diet controlled or on um, metformin uh, or they are your kind of lowest risk and everybody kind of fits in the middle. This is the risk stratification scoring system that they make uh, reference to in terms of various uh, factors that will determine whether your score goes up or down. And this is uh, and uh, they very much gauge the opinion of healthcare practitioners in terms of what they would class as a higher risk or lower risk to try and come up with the scoring system. It's a valiant effort, and I'm all for scoring systems, but they're not a replacement for clinical decision making and discussing things with your patient. There'll be many a patient who's low risk actually. You think actually they just can't fast because they're uh, because their, their risk is high and importantly as well, there are patients who are high risk who actually perhaps are not as high risk because of a number of protective factors. I'll touch on this later that would say, well, actually, maybe you can try fasting. And based on the score, we'll determine whether you fall into a low, moderate or high risk category and a score of six or more uh, puts them in high risk. Uh, and some of the risks to consider, uh, dehydration, uh, diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, HHS, for example, 
hypoglycemia, hyperglycemia. And this is all historically been quoted. These, these four pillars have been quoted time and time again. But the evidence base underpinning a lot of them actually is very is 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 is, is not as high as you think, or strong as you think. And I'll touch on this uh, as well. But as I said, there are limitations with the tool. Um, for example. Uh, if a fast is less than 12 to 14 hours, would that make the risk even lower, for example? And I mentioned many people might sleep overnight and not eat between evening their evening meal and breakfast for in excess of 14 hours. Uh, the use of flash or continuous glucose monitoring, for example, the alarm system, uh, insulin pump therapy, particularly when you have the closed loop system, all these things potentially can lower risk. Uh, but equally, things that may increase risk are prior negative experience of safe Ramadan. And this is uh, a flow diagram taken from the Greater Glasgow and Clyde guidance, which I've used to kind of join between the new risk scoring system and the existing uh, risk uh, stratification table that we have out there. Uh, and this kind of highlights that when somebody perhaps uh, is a higher risk, according to the scoring tool, but you still think, mm, actually, maybe they can fast, they have fasted and they want to fast, then you may try using the uh, uh, a table a tabular based approach to something and a more granular granular approach to seeing whether fasting might be uh, appropriate or not and like i said uh, there is other opinion and guidance on type 1 diabetes out there other than what is in the idf uh, dar uh, guidance uh, sufian hussein and colleagues uh, have uh, published in Lancet Diabetes and Endocrinology for 2020 when it comes to type 1 diabetes and fasting. Uh, and the interesting about Sufyan Hussain is that he is a patient himself with type 1 diabetes uh, who fasts. But again, he understands and appreciates the risks and the importance of planning. Uh, so he's not one to advocate that every person with type 1 diabetes to fast, but it says look at your own individual circumstances and make a decision based on that. My, my own personal view is more aligned with the, the guidance that's out in the diabetes endocrinology, Lancet diabetes endocrinology paper, rather than what is with uh, the DAR guidance. And each individual should make their own uh, healthcare practice, should decide how to look at each uh, uh, guideline and how to apply or follow it according to their patient. Trial and voluntary fasting was something that I had touched upon earlier on, and this has uh, been explained in detail uh, in the BMJ practice pointer uh, by Mahmoud and colleagues from 2022, and many of them are part of the uh, contributory contribute to the BIMA guidance as well. Um, uh, Unfortunately, my the BIMA logo is coming from the bottom of the uh, the last uh, word, but I think uh, uh, that says that is too high risk. So basically, trial fasting or voluntary fasting allows an opportunity to evaluate individuals' risk, particularly if the, this is it is a new this is a new situation since last Ramadan, like as the case of Bilal when he first fasted, or there's been a change in their clinical. Uh, circumstance or severity since the last Ramadan, even though they fasted it. There've been medication changes or medication changes might be needed for Ramadan. Uh, there are other factors that might need to come into play, for example, dehydration, nutritional changes, because there have been changes in weight, for example, since the last uh, year. And then another advantage that also allows uh, for acclimatization to fasting. So fasting a couple of voluntary fasts actually is uh, helps the individual just get into the, the, the physical and mental mindset of fasting before Ramadan starts. Um, and also, if we are thinking, if a patient is high risk, for example, it gives an opportunity to see, well, is this high risk categorization a valid categorization for this individual or not? Uh, and some advice regarding how to go about voluntary fasting, be adaptable. Patients might want a specific instruction, how many times should you perform trial fast for? So again, there's no right or wrong answer. There is no supporting literature, but generally in our experience, uh, three to five practice fasts in the month before Ramadan is probably enough to get a feel for things and maybe a couple of them being consecutive because sometimes it's not so much, so much the individual the intermittent fasting but the consecutive fasting that might be the challenge and it may be uh, that as a result of the uh, of the uh, the voluntary fasting you may say to the individual you're okay to fast maybe three four five days in a row then you might want to take a break to let your body recover for one or two days and that's still a better option than not fasting a month at all or haphazardly approaching a month trying a few fasting getting ill or sick and not and then taking more time off so a structured approach 
might even help in that situation where the clinician feels, you know, I think you're okay for three or four days, but I think your risk of hypos is going up or your risk of dehydration, whatever might pick up after four or five days because of your specific circumstances. And equally, patients might be more willing to terminate a trial fast than a fast in Ramadan because it's a voluntary fast. So that concept of breaking the fast as well can be approached and, and, uh, and, and utilized if needed. And it might make an individual more confident to break the fast in Ramadan if they realize, well, hang on, I had to break it when I was doing the trial fast, so it's fine. Consecutive, uh, alternative consecutive daily fasting. Again, think about is there a risk of worsening disease or delaying uh, convalescence if uh, there's an acute illness involved or, for example, they've had an infection and they have to follow sick day rules. Um, and, uh, if you feel that this, the fasting in the summer when it was the fast for longer is just a no-go area, then they can potentially fast one, two, three, or even several days consecutively in the winter. Because when you're making fast up in the winter, you don't have to make them all up in one go. It's, you just make them up when you can. So as long as you make them up, uh, then that's sufficient. And although some might say you have to make them up within the next year, that's not always the case uh, for some of the schools of jurisprudence. As long as they're made up in their lifetime, it's sufficient. Um, Again, alternate day fasting or fasting a few days and taking a break. So the balance of fasting needs to be made up after Ramadan passes may not be the full 30. It might be 15, it might be 12, it might be 10, it might be 6, it might be 20, whatever it is. And only if there's a perpetual or permanent circumstance that arises from fast uh, uh, from your uh, condition that prevents a person from fasting, then we would say you'd have to pay the fidya. And that's the legal expiation, uh, the, the sharia expiation to fasting. What that means is if you can never fast at all, or you realize you'll never be able to make up your missed fast, then you'd pay uh, the, uh, the equivalent of feeding a poor person for a day. And that usually is around four or five pounds per day uh, if you were to use do a, a UK conversion, it would be cheaper in, uh, in some of the developing countries uh, for all those days they can't fast. And that's the last resort. Some people think, oh, I can't fast, I'll pay the uh, the fidya and then I'll try and fast later. No, it's, ve it's very much a tiered approach and you only pay the fidya if this uh, circumstance is such that it's permanent or persistent, in which case we ask the individual to speak to their imam or religious trusted religious authority for more information on the matter. Specific guidance on IDF DAR, which I think is very useful is a, a, a lot of common sense guidance, but also important to highlight that the importance of checking your sugars uh, regularly when you are on insulin in particular. Uh, and blood glucose testing does not break your fast. Uh, and this is confirmed by uh, imams and scholars. Uh, uh, test at the start of the day and then during the day. Uh, so good thing about starting at the start of the day, it gives you a good understanding of where you are at the start of the day. When I mean start, that's when you keep the fast, start keeping the fast. Uh, if you have a hypo, break the fast, that uh, less than four. And that's specifically, obviously, if you're on insulin and soft on your ears, if you've got a sugar of less than four, you're only on metformin, then you could argue that yeah, a sugar of down to three is probably OK because it's not because that's more in keeping with physiological hypoglycemia. But nonetheless, uh, sometimes individuals not, might not feel good because they're not used to their sugars being as low as that. Um, uh, breaking the fast uh, under four is a good rule to follow uh, and it should be a definite rule to follow when it comes to insulin and sulfonuria. Um, when it comes to the high blood sugars and breaking the fast, again, uh, it's it, it, you have to understand that many patients have poor control, might be fasting anyway. So actually a sugar of 18 might be normal for them and they can tolerate it. Uh, so I, so it's not in and of itself you must, uh, uh, th that, that, they, that they should break it, but certainly it's worth considering if they're not used to having high sugars and they're not used to having the osmotic effects of that. And again, this concept of the word should versus must. Uh, um, I mean, we can give advice and you should do X, should do Y. And then there's the concept of one must do X and one must do Y. Even from a Sharia perspective, even the words should and must are uh, up to the individual whether to follow them or not. Uh, again, uh, the, with the higher sugars, if you have ketones, I wouldn't be keen on somebody fasting if you've got sugars of more than 17 under ketotic. If they're not ketotic and not symptomatic, then again, uh, use individual discretion. In terms of the risk of DKA or diabetic ketoacidosis, uh, this is a paper that we did back in 2019, which showed uh, that, uh, and having subsequent data published as well, uh, meta-analysis published as well, to show that there isn't, uh, or systematic review rather, that the risk of DK isn't really uh, 
uh, higher when uh, uh, when people fast. Uh, probably because those that are at high risk don't fast anyway, or people break their fast before they get to a stage where when they go into DKA. Uh, so does is there more DKA? Well, the short answer is not really, but again, there could be other factors at play there with that. Uh, diet, and I noticed that part of the audience includes Salma Meher, who's an, a very experienced and expert dietitian when it comes to Ramadan, and maybe Diabetes UK can think about doing a, a dietitian based uh, session, just like the one we're doing today, uh, for a bit of guidance on, 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 on healthy eating. But I will touch on it because uh, uh, diet is key to not just Ramadan, but also to diabetes as well. And I'm, I'm showing you photos of some very delicious and palatable food that an individual will be naturally looking forward to if they've been not eating for 14 or 15 hours. And it doesn't matter if you've got diabetes or not. Nice food is nice food. What looks good still looks good. But it's important to understand that when we that foods contain calories and contain different amounts of calories, we have some foods which are more energy dense than others and the amount of carbohydrate within them uh, can be quite significant uh, and, and therefore that can have an impact on glycemic rises particularly when one is opening the fast but also the speed of the rise as well depending on the amount of um, uh, refined carbohydrate there high, high glycemic index versus low glycemic index food so we need to be mindful of things and often when we when individuals open their fast soft drinks fresh juice might all be readily available, accessible, and encouraged to be consumed because there's this concept, I'm dehydrated, but the reality is often the risk of dehydration, particularly in the fast are only 40, 15 hours, is, is, not as, is not that high. Like I said, many people don't drink during the night unless they're, they've got a specific reason to, to do it, but um, sometimes what can happen, you can overdo things and that can be food, drink, uh, both at the time of keeping the fast and opening the fast. Um, and and uh, by looking at this table here for them. It's, it's a reminder to individuals to think about food that they're eating, the amount of carbohydrate, particularly when it comes to type 1 diabetes and bolus insulin, for example. But equally, for example, if individuals are going to or have type 2 diabetes and they're having a very large carbohydrate load and they're on sulfonylurea or normetformin, uh, they still might get a, a spike in their sugars because they're eating more than they ordinarily would at that meal time. So I'm showing you an example here of a suhoor or, 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 or a lot has got the word breakfast there. It's, it's not really breakfast, it's keeping up the fast, but it's closest in terms of time to how we define breakfast in the morning. And you can see there's toast, um, there's Rice Krispies there, uh, there's a cup of coffee, um, there's about 100 grams of carbohydrate there. But then if you take a, uh, and you see there's all, and all the sources, toast, jam, juice, cereal, milk, all these are sources of carbohydrate. Some are perhaps lower glycemic than others, but generally quite a lot of high glycemic index foods there. Now, here's an alternative suhoor, which will have a significant, will, will not be too different when it comes to calories, but the amount of energy coming from carbohydrate is less. And this is something to be mindful of, is that energy just doesn't come from carbohydrate, it comes from protein and fat as well. And having a balanced diet, we have uh, making use, uh, use of all energy substrates is important, particularly when you're concerned about hyperglycemia because you're thinking, oh, I'm taking all these carbohydrates, you take all this insulin. But the reality is, is that you uh, the, the, the risk of hyperglycemia might go up if you, uh, if you, for example, take too much insulin. Equally, if you don't take enough insulin, you might uh, run with high sugars and become osmotic. Common sense message is really nothing there that you would advise an individual when it comes to general uh, healthy eating, when it comes to diabetes, uh, or if, for example, if individuals are undertaking exercise, uh, it's about thinking about your situation, thinking about your, your body, thinking about your needs and thinking about your wants. Uh, and the main thing I'd highlight with Ramadan is, 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 is really the last point uh, is that uh, some people choose to have a bigger meal when they open their fast. Some choose to have a bigger meal when they keep the fast. It's unusual for people to have two large meals, although some might do because they might think they need to feel they need to eat. So understand for your patient which of the two times is going to be the larger meal of day and, and keep that in mind when you're giving advice when it comes to diet or when it comes to uh, managing of their uh, medication in particular. Uh, generally, we would say at the meal before dawn, the suhoor, try and have a balanced meal and have a, a lot of a low GI index foods because that will help the individual feel not as hungry or feel more full because of a slow release and breakdown of the carbs. 
um, it might also avoid a spike in the sugars uh, and, and then th that dilemma of do I correct uh, because I'm high two hours after a meal versus shouldn't I because I'm not really eating later on and I might risk of hypo later on. In terms of oral therapies, uh, this is taken from uh, the um, Glas Greater Glasgow and Fight guidance and so, um, by and large mirrors what's in the IDF DAR guidance and you'll see a lot of trust guidelines will be similar. In fact, our guidelines is, is kind of molded on guys at St Thomas's guidance. Uh, uh, so metformin, very straightforward. Uh, think about the largest meal of the day, try and give the larger dose with the largest meal. Um, and uh, combining of doses when patients are taking metformin three times a day. Generally, you find that most patients with on metformin are taking it twice a day rather than three times a day, so it makes it easier. And generally, you take that larger metformin dose with a larger meal, whenever that may be. Uh, in terms of uh, archibos, uh, there's no modification as the risk of hypoglycemia is low. Uh, TZDs, again, no, no dose modification. Uh, um, or in, under, under one state, they can be taken at any time. DPP-4 inhibitors, same again. Uh, when it comes to sulfonylureas, again, it's a bit tricky uh, depending on uh, the duration of the fast and uh, the, the larger meal of day or not. Um, again, the important thing with this is to think uh, about uh, your patient. Uh, I would avoid avoid try and avoid using the the, the sustained release uh, forms of sulfonylurea, for example, your glimiprides or your uh, modified released uh, glycoside, your dimicrons or whatever, because it's very difficult to manage uh, in terms of second guessing what's going to happen to the sugars. SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP receptor agonists. Again, we're getting more confident using this medication. There is data out there showing that these medications are actually uh, reasonable uh, 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 um, drugs to be used and encouraged to be used because the risk of hypoglycemia in and of itself by using these drugs is not there. When they're used with sulfonylurea and insulin, yes, the risk is there, as is when titrating or starting these treatments at other times. Um, and again, sulfonylurea, uh, sorry, SGLT2s are used for other, have other indications as well, for example, cardiac and renal indications as well. So it comes back to risk stratifying your patient due to multimorbidity, the individual may be advised, excuse me, not to fast, as opposed to fast, in which case dealing with these medications may not be as, as particularly SGLT2s may be a non-issue because they might not be fasting. Equally, we should understand how the mechanis mechanisms of these drugs work as well. So for example, the SGLT2 inhibitors, they have a glucose lowering effect and we know that is maximal until the EGFR reaches around 45 and then it's more of the, the, the sodium effect when the EGFR is less than that. So again, the if the individual is on an SGLT2 inhibitor and they're on insulin as well, but the EGFR is say between 30 and 45, the risk of hypoglycemia might not be that high, but nonetheless, because they're probably higher risk because that multimorbidity has to be balanced with it all. Insulin, again, uh, depending whether you're on basal, basal bolus or biphasic insulin will uh, determine what you do. Basal insulin is generally quite easy, you just reduce the dose slightly and it stays at once a day. And usually we advise taking it at the iftar time because you have that window of being able to eat if you do run into the low sugars. So uh, if it's and, and um, so sometimes we, we often say take the basal insulin at this, uh, when the individual is opening their fast. The bolus insulin again, uh, we just say carb count, follow your normal type one rules, but they may wish to reduce their bolus insulin at the time of keeping their fast just because of the risk of hypoglycemia. I've often found that reduction in basal is probably more useful than reduction in bolus um, when it comes to that managing that risk. When it comes to twice daily insulin, it is a bit trickier, especially when the fast is longer. Uh, when if, um, and I, I generally find that when it comes to twice daily insulin, Either I try and get the patient to be as a bolus if I can, or I, if I think it's too risky or tricky, I tell them to fast in the winter uh, because the fasts are only are 10 or up to even 12 hours, but 10 hours is very manageable and we can easily manage a 10 hour fast with uh, uh, mixed insulin. As I said, BD insulin regimes uh, are challenging with longer fasts. 
there's no easy solution, especially when the meals are close together. Uh, so, for example, when uh, in the, when the fast for very long in the summer, or somebody's doing voluntary fasts or whatever at other times of the year, it's, it's it's very difficult to take a dose of insulin and then try and second guess what to do for another dose when the fast is going to be kept five hours later. Uh, so again, if the risk of hypoglycemia is high or real, then consider an alternative time of year. During Ramadan, so you've you've gone through all the pre-Ramadan preparation workup and you have. Uh, discussed and felt that fasting is an option and you've given all the necessary advice, make sure to monitor your sugars. Involvement of someone in the team uh, early on if control becomes erratic. Uh, this is very important because um, if uh, uh, somebody's having erratic sugars, this is a new circumstance for them. They might not have the experience or confidence. They'll want to reach out quickly. So it's better them reaching out than them trying to do something themselves. Um, so if your trust has that opportunity or you have your hospital or your uh, has that opportunity, then having a link person for the month who can be able to take or field calls when queries come in from patients would be an excellent uh, 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 facility, I think. Again, the importance of being sensible when it comes to fluid and electrolyte reiteration. And one of the things that I want to highlight with this is that the, many individuals will choose to pray at night as well, the extra voluntary prayer, which might be anything from uh, an extra half an hour to an hour and a half over and above the time they spend praying at night. And this will also involve the cycles of prayer, which are all standing, bowing, prostrating. So again, uh, some might be praying on a chair, that's less of an issue, but if they are standing, postural symptoms might come into play, particularly if they've been quite dehydrated or they've been exercising as well. So uh, generally making sure that they keep themselves hydrated before they go for the, the nighttime prayer and hydrate themselves during it as well. Remember, they can eat and drink during the hours of darkness. And again, if the patient is struggling, take a break, as would be the case if you didn't have diabetes and a person was, was, had become unwell, you would not fast. So if, if there is that, that concern that hardship is now becoming uh, no longer hardship, but actually risk of harm, then take a break, whether it's one day, two days, it's fine. It's better to take uh, take that break. If an individual is not wanting to take a break because they feel they they're compelled to fast, then what I would say to them is then break the fast. And this is a very important message I give to all my patients. And normally I mention at the start of my presentation, I think it's worthwhile mentioning now, is that when I speak to my individual about Ramadan and fasting, it's not about abstaining of food and drink. It is uh, the word uh, saum, which is used for fasting, has a root meaning to abstain. The real essence of Ramadan or fasting is to abstain from one's desires and to fulfill God's desires first and foremost. This is why they talk in the verse which makes reference to fasting. Uh, it talks about acquiring God consciousness uh, at the end of the verse, the purpose of it. So what that means is you're putting God and his word and by extension what the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him uh, advise first and foremost above our own individual desires and wants. So if through the Sharia one is advised not to fast, then their fasting is not fasting because they're putting aside their desire to fast for the desire of uh, God, which is not to fast. So they might be eating and drinking, but they have that inherent desire. I want to fast. And it's about controlling that desire. Uh, whereas for an individual who is doesn't have diabetes or isn't unwell or doesn't have a chronic disease or frailty, they're they're giving up their desire to eat for the desire of God, which is for them not to eat in their circumstance. So for me, the essence of Ramadan is about giving up one's own desire for the pleasure of God or for the desire of God. And if you keep that as the theme, then whether a person has to fast or not fast, the the principles are the same, the message is the same, the thought process is the same for the individual. After Ramadan, it's important that individuals, uh, uh, if they can, keep uh, uh, after Ramadan, um, keep, uh, it's good to touch base with your healthcare practitioner if you can. And if they can't, tell them to keep a diary of what went well, what did go well, what changes did they make, what did they learn? Because this is useful information for next year and also useful information for the healthcare practitioner when it comes to advising patients in general. The more experience you have, the more confidence you get from the experiences you acquire, the better you'll get at doing it. Again, other factors to factor in. If the patient isn't going to check their blood sugars and they're on insulin, I would, I'd, I'd be very unkeen for them to be fasting because they're not going to take responsibility. And part of it is that you want the patients to take responsibility for their Ramadan and their fasting. 
uh, and to be able to do it. And you want to be able to trust them to be able to trust themselves to do the right thing. So again, you know your patient better and best. So even if a guideline says one thing, you have to decide whether that guideline is applicable in its entirety or not for your individual patient. Again, that infrastructure, as I mentioned, is key because that can make all the difference. And that, the example of Bilal, for example, when he started off, he had that infrastructure in place, he had access, and, and another individual may not have that. And therefore, they might, their diabetes might be exactly the same, but their circumstances aren't. Again, I don't know how big the slide is coming up on your own screen, whether you in terms of how you've picked your own view. Uh, I think when, when it comes to your viewing options, you can go to you can change it to gallery or whatever is our focus on content to make things bigger. But again, this is a flow diagram which basically focuses on that conversation about discussing things uh, with uh, your uh, patient and documenting things as well if they're choosing to follow the advice or otherwise. Uh, and I think it's very important. Uh, one second, if I can, I. I'm just going to magnify it a bit, see if it gets a bit blurred there. So I mean, it's, it's more for my own reading so I can see what's on the slide a bit better. But basically there are steps there about risk stratifying your patient after you had a conversation about whether they want to fast or not, and after the stratification, whether the risk stratification marries up with what your thoughts are and what the patient's thoughts are. And if they aren't, for example, they want to fast even though they're not, can you give them advice on safe fasting uh, and giving that and documenting that and also stressing and reiterating the fact that uh, they are going against medical advice because it keeps things medical legally on board. And you'll notice that even though I feel very passionate about it, I'm also very passionate about my profession and doing things in a responsible manner that is in keeping with our Hippocratic uh, uh, oath that we have all taken. And again, think of factors such as driving, for example, making sure you give the necessary legal advice to advise, uh, uh, give advice on breaking the fast when it comes to hypoglycemia and driving or breaking the fast if you, have, if you need to follow sick day rules, for example. And again, just breaking it down here to make it a bit easier, we explore the patient's goals for Ramadan, including the spiritual and the lifestyle and the work and the social dimensions, not just the pure religious ones, but all the dimensions. And then the risk stratification. Uh, and again, if they're not fasting, the alternatives to fasting, can they actually fast in winter? So they couldn't fast in the, in the, at this time of year because still fast is too long. Can they fast in winter, maybe fasting one or two days a week over the course of six or eight weeks, and they can do it that way. Again, can they fast some of the month um, uh, and then making the rest up uh, later? Uh, so you've done some of the months. All it's, the, what I'm trying to highlight with this is this is not a digital or binary approach to how we approach Ramadan. It's a granular or a continue uh, has a continuum element to it. Driving on the cards again. Uh, do they know about the do they generally know the DVLA guide? So be surprised how many individuals don't uh, uh, know the DVLA guidance, and this is important. That, they, that you go through this. Many, uh, there will be a number of individuals who have diabetes who are taxi drivers, go to the West Midlands, go to the Northwest. Uh, you'll have uh, uh, many individual with diabetes who will be taxi drivers who may be on sulfonyl ureas, for example, sulfonyl, sulfonyl ureas or insulin, for example, and therefore they should be checking their sugars in relation to driving anyway. This is an important opportunity and uh, an excellent opportunity to revisit that. Again, documenting things. Uh, uh, particularly even if things have been agreed on, just documenting you agreed on things and what you agreed on and uh, if there has been a divergence in opinion as well. But remember, it is the patient or the individual's choice at the end of the day, whether they fast or not. Uh, and uh, as long as the, it, it, it is a decision they have made without which has not been coerced upon them, whether they agree with us or not, that is with anything else, we have to respect their decision. Um, obviously, it can be hard to support an individual when they've gone against medical advice because you just don't have any advice to give because you, you just wouldn't expect someone to fast, but do the best you can. I'm going to go through a few cases and then bring things to a close uh, where we highlight uh, some patients. These are based on uh, uh, modified modifications of real life patients I've looked after um, where uh, individuals had comorbidities and at different times of the year, I've put different years down as well to highlight the duration of fast, how that can impact things. And I had a patient back in 2013 who had type 2 diabetes uh, who wanted to fast. Uh, and the reason I mentioned the years, well, you can then go back and check that uh, it gives an idea of the duration of fast, as I said. Had had a previous cabbage, 
uh, and had type 2 diabetes and they were involved with Glasgow Central Moss in Keen to Fast. And it was a cardiology consultant that had flagged the patient up uh, to ourselves uh, because uh, the GP advised the patient not to fast. The patient wanted to fast and they were having this conversation with the, cardi, um, with the cardiologist and the consultant diabetologist had referred the patient on to me. I was a registrar then, but I had an interest in this. Uh, so again, uh, looked at the time of the meal and which meal was going to be largest. Advised on taking off a pre-dawn meal as well. Uh, and I uh, and, um, and that's what he uh, he was planning to do. And he wasn't planning to change the amount of physical activity he was doing. So what we did was we said, OK, let's see how the fasting goes, but we'll make a change to the metformin dose in reflection of the size of the meal. We actually cut the insulin down by quite a bit as well. And they were going to monitor their sugars. Uh, and I would contact the patient a few days into Ramadan. This is my first real experience of managing a patient. So I was a bit excited as well about it all and quite keen. I accept and appreciate that busy GPs or practices or even uh, DSN will not be able to do this. But nonetheless, sometimes you might want to have a, a deep dive with a patient just to get that confidence. So uh, worthwhile doing it every so often. Uh, and in fact, I increased up the insulin dose towards the uh, end of the month and the uh, HbA1c the month after actually wasn't too bad at all. And there was no hypoglycemia. So again, basal insulin, as I said, a lower risk patient, and we did not too badly. Perhaps moderate or higher risk because you factor in the cardiac disease as well. But the cardiologist didn't have any concerns because the medication could be uh, taken without compromising uh, uh, either the dose or the uh, the timing. And uh, he was happy for the fast uh, to go ahead from a cardiology perspective. This is an example of a, a 46 year old Nigerian lady. Ramadan was in, this is a 2017. So again, fasts were pretty long back then. Um, and had type 2 diabetes. Uh, it was 84 prior to Ramadan and uh, uh, the year before, and it was 54 in 2017. And that was probably the effect of the, the GLP 1 uh, and the SGLT 2. However, she would experience a lot of thirst from the dapagliflozin, and she found that when she used to fast, uh, she'd get urinary tract infections, even if she tried fasting in the winter. And heartburn was also an issue with her. And you'll, many of you know as well that with uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists, that heartburn can sometimes be worse, and particularly when uh, they are not able to eat anything. Uh, and basically, her plan was she doesn't fast, and she just wanted to double check with myself that uh, that she wasn't missing anything, and she feeds poor people because she, even in the winter, they said she can't fast. So winter or summer, she couldn't fast, has tried fasting, has exhausted all means, and therefore she's an example of someone who paid the fidya. Case three, uh, uh, Mr. X, who's a Scottish Egyptian man in his uh, 30s, uh, type 2 diabetes and oral therapy, but from a diabetes, uh, uh, had a, a painful, poorly healing foot ulcer. So from a glycemic perspective, no major concerns, excuse me, in terms of their treatment, but was having a foot ulcer that A was painful and was not healing. And if he doesn't take his analgesia, he would he would adopt a, an abnormal posture. And with that abnormal posture, particularly when it comes to sitting down or praying, for example, um, uh, delay the healing of his foot ulcer. So whilst it wasn't the glycemic control that was at play, it was his complications from the diabetes that was making me think about should this individual fast or not. So what we uh, advised was he didn't fast in Ramadan as he needed to take his analgesia and, and he actually needed to take a course of antibiotics as well. And as you're aware, not necessarily all antibiotics can be taken once or twice daily depending on sensitivities. And he made uh, uh, made the fast up. He could make the fast up when his foot was better, or fasting wouldn't compromise uh, medication. So, for example, fasting in the winter, shorter fasts, so potentially can still manage with analgesia um, and, and and fasting. Case four, uh, a Pakistani uh, gentleman, a bit older, uh, who uh, had uh, chronic kidney disease stage three, uh, and. Uh, he was an individual as well who preferred consulting in Urdu rather than English. So again, don't overlook an, an individual's language preference because that could make all the difference between good education and otherwise. He didn't drive um, and he would check his sugars once or twice a day or gnarly. Uh, so what uh, the plan was for him was that he would fast in the summer and he would make the fast up in the winter. And we didn't need to make too many changes uh, to his medication because the fast were only 10 hours in Glasgow in the winter. However, as of 2020, the EGFR had dipped. He was more frail 
and he just doesn't feed it fast at all because the frailty, the kidney disease, uh, the multimorbidity in men that it just wouldn't be safe or it would be too much risk involved. So he, he now feeds poor people. Um, and then uh, the case five who actually um, is Bilal's case uh, uh, and he's happy for me mentioning and sharing it, which is why I'm making specific reference to him. Um, uh, so um, the main thing with this uh, with Bilal was he was driving as well. And my main concern for him was the uh, the importance of checking his sugar regularly and breaking sugars. Uh, so breaking his fast when, uh, when his sugars would dip and he would do that and he still does that. The difference now he's got a Libra, which can help sometimes give him an, a, a feel for what, where his sugars are heading before he didn't have a Libra. Uh, and I'm really highlighting those, uh, th th that first kind of first couple of years when he would fast, how he would uh, reduce his lattice dose down and he was still honeymooning as well. So sometimes individuals are honeymooning. So actually you might find that they become very sensitive to insulin. So if you have a patient with new type 1 diabetes, if they're honeymooning, then you may have to, uh, they, they might feel that because they're honeymooning, they could probably fast. Again, if you have to look at the individual. I'm not there to say yes, they must or no, they shouldn't, but highlight the, the, the issues that come up from discussion when it comes to uh, the, the nuances for each individual patient. Uh, and again, staying in contact with the team. So when it comes to the future, when it comes to uh, where do we see Ramadan and diabetes? Well, again, I think one thing we've realized by looking at those early slides is the duration of fast has a big part to play in terms of how safe a patient will be and what we do. Um, again, actively risk stratifying individuals, trying to identify your patients in advance of Ramadan, like a good few weeks so we can make changes and not feel under pressure to do a rush job and do something substandard. The good thing about Ramadan is that if you invest once in a patient, you might find that subsequent Ramadans become less labor intensive unless there are changes to a circumstance. So I accept individuals are very busy and this is a pressed national uh, NHS, but maybe doing some small group education might be a, a way of striking the balance, getting people who are similar, uh, who you think might be who could group together, but you might be able to get them to discuss things or whatever it is. I'm not there to say it must be this way or that way. Creating a network of resource physicians experience in actively preparing and reviewing patients. So, for example, in your trust, what works best for you? The needs for dietitians who are of similar ethnic or religious backgrounds as a patient. And this is very important and some I'm sure will agree with this. Uh, we, we did a session, for example, uh, for radio in Blackburn and we did that. We, 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 we by and large, we did, it, we did it bilingual or do it in English to reflect the listenership. Uh, patients will not open up if they can't relate. It's our job to be able to make ourselves relatable to patients, even if you're not of the same faith or ethnicity. Everything is based on trust. If you remember these key messages, you'll be surprised how much mileage and how much discussion and how much progress you can make with patients. In terms of studies moving forward from an academic perspective, I think pragmatic studies are the way forward. Sometimes you have very protocolized studies. They might be applicable or relevant to one uh, part of the world, but not to another part, one time of the year, not to another. So I think a pragmatic approach is key. So just to conclude, the management of diabetic patients uh, during Ramadan is challenging and needs to be tailored and patient centered. Planning needs to start early, which is why we're doing this sort of session now two months in advance. The multidisciplinary approach, an opportunity for weight loss again by calorie, by paying attention to the calories in is very important. I haven't talked too much about exercise because I think exercise is something that we um, uh, have to be very on the ball with when it comes to our individual patients and knowing what goes on. But as a general rule, what I would say is that uh, do not try and take on new strenuous exercise in Ramadan when you haven't been doing it uh, prior to Ramadan and avoid doing it early in the day when it comes to uh, of the fast because of dehydration and try doing it uh, later on and build things up uh, as well. Uh, or even try maybe just doing less intensity. Because even if you're in that last hour before Ramadan starts, you might have to drive back from the gym. You don't want to have a hype on the way home and either have an accident because you don't want to break the fast or you feel that you've wasted the fast. In terms of resources, we've got the Diabetes UK resources 
uh, available here, and these have been re reviewed and revised with the uh, collaboration with the British Islamic Medical Association. One thing we did find that initially guidance wasn't really looked at by patients or imams because they felt that there were mixed messages. Diabetes UK were telling individuals not to fast, and obviously individuals wanted to. So we, we, we have reflected this in the latest guidance by recognising it's an important time um, for individuals and that they want to fast. Uh, so. Uh, understanding the importance of Ramadan to the individual and then putting the message of safety as well. We've got the learning zone as well, where we've got uh, um, uh, videos uh, for the South Asian community in different languages. So this is for general guidance on uh, um, management of diabetes, but there are also video, uh, Ramadan videos in English, Urdu and Saleti. And this is obviously something that we're keen on uh, doing in terms of reaching out to patients in the language and terminology that they can uh, relate to. And finally, uh, just some references here when it comes to other related conditions. So the Mahmoud paper, when it comes to chronic disease management, there's also the cardiovascular disease uh, uh, paper in heart. We've got the epilepsy guidance uh, that's been published as well. Adrenal insufficiency, which does actually have an evidence base, and this uh, practical guideline is actually endorsed by the Society for Endocrinology, and we have patient guidance out there as well, so on the web, um, uh, which has been endorsed by uh, the various charitable or uh, patient groups, including uh, the Pituitary Foundation and the Addison Society. Um, we have chronic kidney disease guidance as well, uh, and we've got some. Uh, COVID related queries, I guess less relevant now, but nonetheless, sometimes it comes up. Uh, so these are various papers there. I'm just taking control back. And then some acknowledgements to various people who helped prepare this guidance and uh, a lot of the work that we've done in the past. Uh, some names are familiar to many of you from the diabetes field or from the primary care field, and uh, some may not be who are very local to us. And I'm going to hand over back to Aoife uh, for the concluding uh, remarks and to take any questions. Thank you, Nazim, and thanks for that. And, and of course, a huge thank you to you and to Bima for helping with the review of the Ramadan materials at Diabetes UK. As you say, we, we've changed the tone of a lot of the articles and um, made much more of an acknowledgement of the importance of Ramadan, uh, which I think has made a real difference to how those are perceived. Um, so we have got the Slido poll now, if anyone's got any questions. There are a couple in there already, um, so I will pick those up. And if you've got any more you want to pop in there, um, so the first question we have is, why would your blood glucose rise during a fast, Nazim? So sometimes what happens is individuals eat more because they think they're fasting and they might go hungry or they might have a hypo. So they actually overeat uh, or compensate, shall we say, in that regard. Also, when it comes to opening the fast in particular, individuals get together and have parties, iftar parties. A lot of refined carbohydrate, a lot of uh, fat rich uh, food as well uh, that is consumed, fizzy drinks. Uh, and you'll be surprised how many people will find that Ramadan can be 30 days of fasting and 30 nights of feasting. Equally, sometimes individuals might cut back on their basal insulin because they're concerned about hyping and they might overcut initially, which is why the, the voluntary or trial fasting is of value because it helps uh, uh, get a feel for things before Ramadan starts. Thank you. We've got a couple of questions as well, noting that the HbA1c's improved in your case studies, mm -hmm. and somebody asking if that was uh, if persisted after Ramadan was finished. Uh, so um, generally, what you find is that a um, bit of both. Sometimes they actually regress to the mean. They go back to their their less healthy disciplined life of the remaining eleven months, and their HbA1c can go back to its baseline. Sometimes you find that patients have made an, a, a change and improvement, and it stays because they've lost weight as well. They want to keep their weight down, for example. So you get a bit of both. And also a question in there um, about uh, women with gestational diabetes who require medication. Do you have any mm -hmm. specific advice for those? So gestational diabetes very much depends what the medication is. If it's metformin, then uh, it would be to be seen as lower risk. And again, usual sick day advice rules given. To, but the main thing was, uh, pregnant and expectant mothers is don't overestimate or uh, under uh, uh, estimate rather the impact of uh, hyperemesis gravidarum, so the nausea and vomiting, because you might find that because of the nausea and vomiting, they can't really 
know, do a suhoor when they keep the fast or they struggle to eat a larger meal. So actually for them, fasting can be quite difficult. But if the hyperemesis gravidarum is not an issue and they're just on metformin or diet control, generally no specific advice is needed apart from general advice you'd give to any patient with diabetes in Ramadan. However, if they are on insulin, then again, you would apply the same principles when it comes to type 1 diabetes, for example, or individuals on basal bolus insulin. Uh, remember, in pregnancy, the targets are tighter. So we uh, and we're dealing with two bodies. We're dealing with the mother and that of the fetus. So uh, unless you know the individual is very good on the ball, will break their fast if they need to, and they've got excellent control and they've done some trial fasting, you might find a by and large uh, expectant mothers who are on insulin. There are probably one group that you'll find will generally not be fasting and uh, unless stated otherwise. Uh, and the final question is on monitoring patients having um, tr uh, tr a trial of fasting. How do you mm -hmm. do this in the hospital setting? And um, have you got any advice for how this might transfer to primary care? So again, this is where the team approach is in, required, where you want the, the community, uh, either the CDSNs or the diabetes specialist nurses, because often patients can stay in touch via email and things. So uh, I would very much uh, take the the view that you want to have a consultation at least 30 to 60 days before Ramadan starts. So you can have even the conversation about trial fasting so that as you get closer to Ramadan, you've, you've had a, a, at least one conversation, then you actually do the trial fasting and then they can report back. I think one thing I'd very much do is encourage patients to keep a diary of things in terms of what they did, how it went, and emailing that into their uh, uh, diabetes specialist nurse. When it comes to primary care, it might be the practice nurse or usually you have a lead nurse or, or a clinician who has an interest in diabetes. Maybe they can, uh, if they can, put a bit of time aside. If they can't put time aside and you're firefighting, again, the important thing is give them general principles about doing trial fasting, give them the sick day rule advice uh, so that they know when to break the fast and get them to report back uh, if they have any uh, any concerns or issues. If it goes well, then you could probably say, okay, you know what works, do it. But again. If you feel the need to break the fast or take a break, for uh, do that. Thank you. And and one's just snuck in at the end. Any advice specifically for people who are vegetarians around diet? Uh, vegetarians. <laughs> the short answer is no, because I think uh, when it comes to healthy eating, healthy eating is healthy eating, and if uh, they are not eating around the clock. I would, uh, the, con uh, the same principles apply in terms of low glycemic index foods um, and uh, avoiding high glycemic index uh, 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 foods um, at, when keeping the fast. And also uh, when it comes to uh, hydrating, making sure hydration is addressed. Uh, again, it might be something worth covering in a future session. But the good thing about doing a session with a dietitian is you don't necessarily need to do it uh, uh, three, four, five weeks in advance. You can even do it a couple of weeks in advance of Ramadan. Uh, so it might be worth uh, while having a session where we can address even specific scenarios such as the vegetarian uh, diet uh, when it comes to fasting. One thing I would say is that with lots of people doing intermittent fasting now for health reasons, Ramadan fasting actually is actually quite a safe uh, um, fast now, now at the, at the time of year that we've, we've approached. The difference obviously is we can't have any water to drink, well, which is the main difference with intermittent fasting, but sometimes the intermittent fasting individuals might be fasting for as much as 24 hours. So I think uh, Ramadan fasting has in many ways been seen as uh, a safer now that a lot of individuals are embarking on intermittent fasting. Thank you. Yeah, that's a, that's a really interesting point. Um, so I think we, we've fit, run out of questions and we're coming up to the end of our time. Uh, so it just remains for me to thank you, Nazim, for this has been a fantastic and really interesting talk. And I can see everyone in the um, chat has really enjoyed it as well. Um, there is another session of this next week on Thursday evening. So if you know of other colleagues you think might benefit from this, might be interested, please do share the link. They can still um, sign up for it. And then after that session, this will be on our YouTube channel um, for you to find as well. So thank you very much to everyone who's joined. Um, we are just going to share the Slido poll again now. So <clears throat> if you're able to fill in with how you feel after this session in terms of your confidence in managing Ramadan, that'd be great for us. Um, and we will send you a survey after this as well to fill in. But thank you very much to everyone who's joined and do tell um, your colleagues about our session next week as well. Thank you for as well for the opportunity. And one thing I would say is that a lot of the slides were quite uh, detailed in content. But I'm hoping that when the YouTube uh, 
a link goes out that there'll be bookmarks at each slide change so that if individuals with heading so that if individuals want to recap specific slides, they potentially will have the opportunity to do that when it's on the YouTube channel. 